I feel like in maybe some way that I need to put a curtain up right here because I'm about to have confessional time right here between you and I today. Uh, we're going to talk about something that I normally would never talk about in service, but I think it's important that you know that I read every single email that I get. The email that I'm about to tell you about today was an email that I probably received probably six, seven years ago. So just so you know that it's not valid, it's not, it's not relevant today, but it was one of those emails that as I read it, I thought to myself and I thought, hmm, that might be one of the dumbest emails I have ever received. And I just want you to hear this all the way through now. If this was you, and I'm not intending to hurt your feelings in any way. I received an email that kind of went like this. Now, I'm paraphrasing, so please uh, bear with me if this was you. Um, the email went kind of like this. Pastor Dave, mm, I don't think that our church is very spiritual, and here's the reason why. Catch this. There is too much laughing in the church that we don't take God Seriously, because if we were going to be a church that loved God and wanted to be spiritual and follow him, then we have to be serious about who God is. And there should never be any laughter in the church. Okay, so I'm going to stop right there. Here goes the, the curtain away. Here's what I started to do. I took the email and printed it off, and I began to crumble it up, and I got ready to throw it in the trash, and then I picked it up, and I straightened it all out again as much as I could, and I said, I am going to save that. And here's the reason why I saved it. Folks, there is something in a mentality that's not just from this individual, but it's from a lot of other people that think that in order for us to be spiritual, that we have to eat lemons and we have to live like that, right? I mean, we have to be grumbly people. We have to be people that are stoic and without movement, without feeling, without without expressing anything about who we are when it comes to our relationship with Jesus Christ. And I understand that side of it. I get where people come from. But I want you to know this morning that there is another side to that story. Let me ask you this question as we begin our time together this morning. Have you ever been on the other side of that? When you have walked alongside of people that just tend to be a breath of fresh air. Have you ever been around somebody like that? That no matter when you go around them, no matter what they're going through in their life, they just seem to always be so pleasant. There are people that you just want to gravitate around. You want to be around them all the time. So how? How can we be people like that? I mean, we want to be around people like that. Why don't we and how do we become people like that? Why aren't we people like that? Now, I don't want to be very careful this morning and tell you, I'm not talking about this giddy kind of joy. I'm not talking about, you know, let's just, you know, uh, you know let's just sing songs together. And let's just not take anything seriously. Let's just joke around and tell this and tell that. I'm not talking about that kind of giddy kind of joy. Because the truth of the matter is, if you were to look at Jesus' life, there was sorrow in his life too. But you know what that sorrow was about? It was about the lost people. And once that day comes that he comes back and he makes all things right, there won't be any sorrow anymore. When you think about who Jesus is at the core of who he is, what his default mechanism is, it is joy. It is a joy of the Lord that he has that he wants to give to you and to me. It's something that is not a given. It's something that you and I are taught. And it's something, folks, that we all must have. As a follower of Jesus Christ, he desires and he expects that his followers have the joy of the Lord. We're going to talk about that this morning. Because I don't think, when I think about people, and I was telling my Sunday school class about this this morning, I think that all of us, including myself, we are all like skunks, aren't we? I mean, I mean, we all have this aroma, don't we? I'm not talking about the, the B.O. type of aroma. I'm not talking about that kind of aroma. I'm talking about this perceptive of life aroma. It's the way that we look at life. There's just something about what we carry around with us that when we're around other people, they just know what kind of people we are. Are we grumbly people? Are we people that find joy in life? I mean, granted, we all go through ups and we all go through downs. I know that. But in the midst of all that, there's something about people like that that are a breath of fresh air that we can't help but gravitate to. I want to be one of those people. 
I want to be one of those people that when they see me, they don't see me, but they see something in me. There's something that comes out of me that they want to be around me. Because if I can get them to be around me, they get to hear something that I heard a long time ago. And that's the story of Jesus Christ. In a way that shapes them and molds them and draws them into him. I want to be a part of that. But if your aroma stinks and nobody wants to be around you, how can you ever be effective for the kingdom of God? That's why this message today, I think, is so very important. So by the way, where do we get this idea anyway? That a person who wants to be spiritual and godly, they have to suck on lemons to begin with. I don't understand where that all came from. And i got to be quite honest, when I think about that question that was posed to me, that email that was sent to me a long, long time ago, I thought, man, that may have been one of the stupidest emails I've ever received, one of the stupidest things I've ever heard, but guess what? It's not the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Let me give you something that's even crazier than that. This won't apply to any of my message today, just so you know it, but I think you'll get a kick out of this. I have a package that's in my office right now. Anyone who wants it, I want you to know I'll be happy to give it to you at free of charge. This came from an article on the internet. These are actually transcripts from court cases. Things that lawyers actually said in the courtroom. Everything I'm about to read to you is 100% fact. Okay, because it's on the internet. So you know it's got to be true. Okay, let's talk about some really dumb questions. Okay, here's the first. The doctor's on the stand. And the lawyer asked him this question. He says, sir, isn't it true, sir, that when a man dies in his sleep, he doesn't know about it until the next morning? <laughs> this is true. I got a better one. Here it is. Were you present at the time that your picture was taken? I mean, I don't know. Maybe I was somewhere else. I, I, what kind of answer is that? Okay, here's another was it you or was it your younger brother that was killed in the war? These are actual questions that were asked in court. Okay, here's another. How far apart were the two vehicles at the time of the collision? See, some of you are going, sounds fine to me. I love people like you, by the way, just so you know. Here's another one. This may be in another country, I, I don't know. Can you describe the person who threatened you? Yes, he was a medium built and he had a beard. And the attorney's response is this. Was that person a male or a female? <laughs> Good night. And you thought my first email was bad, right? No. These are just a sample. What does that have to do with the message today? Absolutely nothing. So don't write any of that down. But this morning, we want to seek God's face. We want him to speak to us because, folks, I believe this with all my heart. If we could become the kind of person that God calls us to be, the work that he has for us here on earth will forever change our lives. It'll change the lives of other people. One day we'll look back and we'll wonder, did our lives matter for anything? I want my life to matter for him. I want people to look at me and not think of me, but I want them to see Jesus in me. I want people to see Jesus in us. So let's seek him right now as we look into his word together, shall we? Let's pray. Father, this morning, Lord, how desperately we need you. For us to live our lives with our own strength, our own desire, and our own will, Lord, we'll never demonstrate that which is in us, that which should be in us, and that's you. Lord, you say that when we are weak, that is when you are strong. That when we are down, you are like, you are the wind beneath our wings. You are that which lifts us up. You are that strong tower, Lord, that we can run to. There is something about knowing that regardless of our circumstances or the settings around us, Lord, that we can take joy in the Lord. Father, help us this morning. Help us, Lord, to look and, and as we look at our lives, as we, as we evaluate our lives, Lord, that we would see what needs to change so that, Lord, that we too might be able to say to others, there is the joy of the Lord that is in us. Help us, Lord, today. I ask in the precious and the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen and amen. All right, so here's what I want to talk about this morning. How do you and I create a default mechanism that brings us back to joy in our lives. At the core of who you are, at the core of who I am, there ought to be joy. 
There ought, to, there ought to be joy that is not just perceived by what happens to us, but what is inside of us. There's a difference. And I want us to talk about that this morning. So in case you're wondering, Pastor, where are you getting this whole the joy of the Lord thing? I want to show you just a few passages this morning to kind of set us up for where we're going today. So if you have your Bibles, if you don't have them, you can look on the, on the screen with me this morning. I want to start with Nehemiah chapter 8 this morning. We're going to look at Nehemiah chapter 8 beginning with verse 9. And I want you to hear this all the way through as I read this together today. So let me read this with you. Then Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who were instructing the people said to them, All, this day is sacred to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, for all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. And then I want you to look at verse 10. Nehemiah said, Go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is sacred to our Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So we're talking about not any kind of joy, but we're talking about a specific kind of joy, the joy of the Lord. And there is a difference. Let me talk about two specifically. There is happiness and there is joy. Joy that is not because of the circumstances out there, but the joy of the Lord. So when you and I think about happiness, I, I'm sure that all of us would agree that happiness for most of us comes because of the happenstances around us. Our situations, our circumstances. When things go well for us, we're happy. When things don't go well for us, we're unhappy. There's something about that that happens only because of circumstances. The joy of the Lord is different. The joy of the Lord says it does not matter about the circumstances. It doesn't matter about what happens to you today or what happens to you tomorrow. There's the joy of the Lord that is in you, not because of something that you have experienced per se, but something that you have learned, something that you have grown to understand. There's something that happens inside of you and me that regardless of what the world brings us, the joy of the Lord is always consistent. It doesn't change because of circumstances. That's why when we talk about there is a difference between being happy and a person who has the joy of the Lord. Now, if you were to take the Lord out of it and just say joy, well, yeah, you could add joy into happiness of the world. But when we say the joy of the Lord, it is different. It does not matter what we go through. Whether it's the best of days or the worst of days, the joy of the Lord is always in us if we desire it. So this morning, that's what we're going to talk about. And if I could give you a quick example of that, about happiness from the terms of the world standpoint. When you're in grade school or in high school, you think, I'm going to be happy when I graduate from school. And then you graduate from school and you're still not happy yet. So you say to yourself, well, I'll really be happy when I get married. And you get married and guess what? You're still not happy yet. But you say to yourself, I'm not happy, but if we could have kids, then life would really be happy. We would have everything that we truly want. Then life would be happy again. And you have kids, and you're still not happy. And then you're, got, you're married, and you have kids, and you think, I'll be happy when the kids move out, right? And it, they move out, and you're still not happy. And then there's those sick people who say, if only my kids would move back home again, then I would be happy again, right? I, it, the cycle goes on and on and on. But at the end of the day, folks, those are all because of experiences. It is not because of something that is in here. It's not because of something that the Lord has done. We try to find happiness and joy in the things of the world. And God says that's the reason why people look at the church and they see grumbly people. They see people that don't seem to be very happy about who they follow or who they are. And I want us to be different than that. I want people to see you and to see me and say, there is something different about them. So that's why we're looking at this together today. See, God's strength and God's gift to you and to me is the joy of, his Lord, of, of the Lord. It's the joy of who he is. In fact, Matthew chapter 25, verse 11 talks about these, these few that had the opportunity to invest what he had given to them. And this is what he says in reply at, at the end of the day. He says, he says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. By the way, this is the King James Version I'm reading from. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of my Lord, into thy Lord. Folks, I mean, you might think as you read that story, well, yeah, we're joyful now because now we've got more. It was because I received more, and because I've received more, now I'm joyful again. No, it has nothing to do with what he was given. It was about receiving what God had for him. 
First John chapter uh, 1, verse 4 says this, Write this to make our joy complete. What joy? God's joy. John chapter 15, verse 11 says this, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. When it comes to God defining joy, it's a non-optional thing. It's something that he requires. It's something that he desires for you and for me to have. And if you're looking at your life right now and you don't find joy, then you don't have the joy of the Lord. Because there's something that God offers to you and I every single day if we depend upon him, that we experience with him, and that's his joy. And what is that about? What is this joy that we're talking about? Well, let me read to you something that C.S. Lewis said. He said this. He says that joy is the serious business. I want you to write this down, by the way. C.S. Lewis says this, that joy is the serious business of heaven. Can you imagine that? C says that, that, that joy is the serious business of heaven because when people see the joy of the Lord inside of you, they understand that you're going through the same things they are, that you're experiencing the same things they are, but the way that you respond is different. And it's not because of who you are. Don't give yourself that much credit. Remind yourself of what it is that Jesus has done for you. And we're going to get to what that is in just a moment, that we take great joy in. But there's the other side of that, too. On the other hand, joylessness, if that's even a word, is a serious sin to God. In fact, I think it's one that is indulged more in the church than any other. In fact, I was telling my Sunday school class this morning that joylessness is probably the one most tolerable sin in the church today. I think it's one of the most tolerable sins in the church today. Nobody comes into my office for counseling over not having joy in their life. No one says to another brother or sister, brother or sister, you and I need to talk because you don't have joy. We let it go. We let it pass by. All the other sins, we're quick to acknowledge. We're quick to tell our brother or our sister what is wrong. But how many times have you ever seen a brother or a sister go to another brother or sister and say, you don't have joy. Where is your joy, you brother, you sister in the Lord? That's an important thing for us to think about, folks. Think about this. Think about the damage that joyless Christians have done in the church. Think about that for just a second. Think of how many times in the church today that joyless people have damaged the church all because of one simple thing. They had no joy. Therefore, nothing around them mattered. Nothing around them was any good. Nothing around them had value to it. And you know, just so that you're aware, joy is what makes you attractive. You know, we spend a lot of time with our looks. We think a lot about our money. We wake up in the morning, and many of you spend a lot of time putting makeup on. But it's your joy in your life that makes you attractive. It is not those other things. And regardless of the circumstances around you, beyond the the present afflictions that you go through, can I say to you this morning, we have won. Can I say that to you again? We have won. Folks, if you're wondering about why you should be joyful today, let me tell you why. Because you and I are victorious. I was waiting for that. I said it over and over just to hear that. Because we are. You are. If you've received him as your Lord and Savior, there is victory. And I want to just, I wrote this down and I wanted to make sure that you understood where I was going with this. The joy of the Lord is knowing that his ways are perfect and that he has won the race. His ways are perfect and he has won the race. I want you to almost imagine it's like this. Jesus is up to bat And it's the bottom of the ninth. And there's two outs. Three balls and two strikes. Full count. And Satan is pitching. And he thinks that he has won the victory. And Jesus stands up to the plate. And he knocks it over the fence. And Jesus takes a lap. Touches every base. And the victory that he won was not in the healing of his ministry. It wasn't in the preaching of his ministry. 
It was when Satan thought that he had him in a corner and there was no place for him to go except to die. And it was on the cross that he won it for you and for me. And do you know what that means? It's a responsibility that you and I have. Because now he requires that you and I run the basis of life. Do you get that? That now he said to the church, to the church, I want you to now validate that. I want you to validate what I have done, and I want you to touch all the bases. Now, you know, normally when somebody hits a home run, you know, you don't just say, oh, well, he hit the home run, let's get up and go. There's a validation that takes place, right? Because that batter now goes and he touches first, second, third, and he touches home. Everybody stops to wait for that final base. And you know how they run to every base. I've never seen somebody hit a home run and run to first and slide. Have you ever seen that before? I've never seen somebody then pick up their feet and then go to second and then just wrap it around the second base and just hold on. I've never seen anybody do that. When someone hits it out of the park, they celebrate they run the bases as if there's something to celebrate for. And folks, let me tell you this morning, you and I have something to celebrate today. The joy of the Lord is offered to you and to me because of what Jesus did on the cross. And on Good Friday, he knocked it right out of the park, didn't he? And he validated who he was. In fact, Hebrews, I don't know, I, I got this picture in my mind about what I'm about to read to you next. I, I, I imagine people who do not have the joy of the Lord, but say that they're Christians. And they're running the bases, and they're acting like I just described. They're sliding to first, grumbling and complaining. They're sliding to second, grumbling and complaining. They're going to third, doing the same thing. And I wonder if the angels in heaven think this when we read this next verse. Look at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, and it says this. Therefore, since we, have a surround, we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us can you imagine them looking up from heaven the angels watching you and I living out our lives knowing that you and I have the victory in Jesus Christ and we're living our lives acting like talking like and being like what we are I wonder what they think tear off the stuff that hinders you guess what there's victory Whatever you're facing right now, and God forbid it's horrible, you have victory in Jesus. And it's not going to be affected by your circumstances. It doesn't matter whether or not your surgery went well. It doesn't matter whether you're in a nursing home. It doesn't matter because the joy of the Lord is yours. It's in you because of what Jesus did. It's what he has already done for you. And folks, if the church would wake up and be reminded of that today, can you imagine the impact that we would make on the kingdom of heaven? Imagine what we would do. Imagine that you and I have now a responsibility to run the bases. As a father, you have a base to run. As a mother, a daughter, a son, an uncle, a, a cousin, whatever role you have, you and I are called to run the bases. Not as if we've lost, but knowing that we've won. We've won the victory, not because of my strength and not because of yours, but because of Jesus and Jesus Christ alone. And no matter what our circumstances are, we have won. So how do we do that? How do we change the way that we are? How do we become those type of people, people who have the joy of the Lord? Well, I want to give you a couple things this morning, and then we'll wrap up. So let, just write these couple things down, if you will, for me. The first is this. Learn to trust God's plans. Learn to trust God's plans. Isaiah chapter 55 verse 9 says this, As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Sometimes, you know what? We just don't see what God's plan is. But we just trust it. I don't know what tomorrow's going to hold for me, but I just trust it. Because I know that he is greater, he is wiser, and he knows exactly what I need. I can just simply trust him. Uh, someone once gave this to me as an example, and I want to share it with you, and I hope it makes perfect sense, because once I heard it, I said, that right there helped me to understand. I want you to imagine for a moment that there was a projector right here, and it's shining up against this wall over here. And you know how you have those frames in, in a movie? And some, some movies have lots of frames. I mean, there are movies that are three hours long, and man, that's a long movie. 
But imagine if you would that, that as you're looking at this projector and, 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 the, and the light is shining across the other side, there's a frame, one frame, just one frame, just one little block. And that frame is your life. And you look at it and you say, wow, I'm not impressed. I just see this little thing here, this one little glimpse, this one little snapshot, if you will. But if you watch the whole movie, there's something about brings it all together, right, that you understand everything about it. When you see the whole picture, then it makes sense. But for us, we look at that one little frame and we say, I don't understand. How could that be the, the just of my life? How could that be everything that I need to know? I need to know more than that. And we may never know more than that until we see the big picture, when we see the whole thing. And that's why 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 13, verse 12, Paul says this to you and I. Now we see but a poor reflection, as in a mirror. But then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, he says, even as I am fully known. You see, Paul says, I don't have to understand everything. In fact, I just see a little glimpse of it right now. But one day I will know fully. I'll understand why my little, my little part, my little opportunity mattered so much. In fact, we were just talking about it this morning in Sunday school class. You don't know how one experience, one thing that you do, might be the one thing that God has called you to do that will forever impact not one life, not two lives, but many lives for the kingdom of heaven. You have no idea, and you won't know until the other side of heaven. So don't lose heart. When you see just a little part of your story. Don't lose heart when you don't see the whole picture. The second thing is this. Learn to think like Jesus. And that's a question that we have to ask ourselves. So what is that? How do we do that? How can we begin to know? If we were to talk about how to think like Jesus, we could do a hundred part series and we would never get done. It would just go on and on and on. But let me talk to you for just a moment this morning about the joy of the Lord. How do you do that? Let me give you two quick little things this morning. They're not on the screen, but I want you to write these down anyway because they're important. The first is this. You need to do this. Make peace with imperfection. Make peace with imperfection. What do I mean by that? That you don't worry about what you do wrong? I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about you looking at what is the main thing. Not about all the little things that you and I could complain about, but what are the things that really matter? What are the things that really matter for the kingdom of God? I think about these four friends as Jesus was teaching in this house. And Jesus was not impressed with the fact that these four friends put a hole in the ceiling to bring their friend down. He wasn't impressed by that. He wasn't impressed with their, with their maneuvering, the way that he put ropes to bring them down slowly, right in the middle of where Jesus would be. Jesus was not impressed with that. You know what Jesus was impressed about when he saw them? It was their faith. It was their faith. They began to, to look at what was right, what they needed, what was important, and it was trusting in who he was, knowing that no matter what, if they could just get their friend to Jesus, they knew what Jesus could do. It was the faith in believing in him. So to think like Jesus is to know that he's in charge. And you know, I don't know about you, but if I were to try to make this more realistic in our day, I'd tell you a story that I probably have told too many times. I've told the story about a friend that just started getting interested, wanted to know more about Jesus, and he started coming to our church. And we had a big 4th of July celebration at our church, and he, had, he was still growing, he was still learning. And a whole bunch of people were gathered around him, gathered around him, and they were talking and having a good old time. And then all of a sudden, he pulls out a cigarette and he lights it. And as soon as he lights the cigarette, you know what happened? Everybody dispersed. Nobody stuck around. You know what they saw? They saw the cigarette. They didn't see what Jesus saw. They didn't see the soul. Didn't see the person. I've had people say, you know what? I, if that person's drinking, I'm not going to be around them. You know what? If anybody has the right to talk about hating and being around the alcohol, it's me. My life was horrible with alcohol. My, parent, my, my father was an alcoholic for most of my life, and it was a struggle all the time. But you know what was behind the alcohol? It was my father. It was a soul. Sometimes you got to look beyond the can to see what God is looking at. And what's on the other side of that can is a person that Jesus loves. And he wants them to come to him, to know him. And i got to tell you, folks, it is so important that you and I get what's important. 
And we get what's right when it comes to our walk with him. And I know that there's struggles and I know that there's things that we don't like, but you remember what it is that God loves more than anything. And that's his creation. It's what he seeks to, it's what he seeks to long for. It's what he seeks to bring closer to him. It's what he wants in a, in a relationship. And you and I are called to be a part of that. The second thing is this that I want you to write down too. And we've never done this, but I think that we should make it a day. In fact, I don't think we should just make it a day. I think we should make it permanent. We need to do this. We need to declare a fast from grumbling. We need to declare a fast from grumbling. Philippians chapter 2 verse 14 says this. Do everything without complaining or arguing. And let me tell you, in case you don't think that's a big deal and you just think that sounds like just positive thinking, let me tell you that this is the bait that you and I give to Satan every time. When you and I grumbling, when you and I grumble, it is the bait that we lift out and we hang out there for Satan. Why do I say that? Let me read this verse to you. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 10, it says this. And do not grumble as some of them did and were killed by the destroying angel. You see, grumbling creates joylessness. And when Satan gets you there, folks, he has a hold on you. It doesn't matter what's going around. It doesn't matter what God is doing. But you bait that grumbling out there for Satan and he will devour you. He will devour me every single time. When you and I grumble, you stop and you think about this for just a minute. When you and I grumble, think about the way that it changes the perception of our relationship with people around us. Think about the way it changes the relationship that you have with God. Think about what it does to you when you're on the highway and somebody cuts out in front of you. And how do you respond? Or you can do what I do. Imagine what happens when you go to Walmart. And see, everybody knows, right? It changes the way that we look at things. It changes the way that we act. But it shouldn't. It shouldn't. Because every time we grumble, every time we bait it out there, Satan takes a hold and he will destroy. Every single time he'll destroy. Now I've said that, but let me go on to the third thing this morning, and this is important too. This is where it's going to sound like, you know, Pastor Dave, you just want to sing Kumbaya and let's everybody get along. No, I think it's far beyond that. The third thing is this, and I think we need to do this. We need, we need to learn to celebrate often. We need to learn to celebrate often. You know that God established so many feasts in the Old Testament. Do you know why he did it? Because he knew that we would forget. He knew that we would stop, that we wouldn't do it, that we'd forget about the feast. In fact, he says this. Let me read this to you. We, in fact, most of us have a tendency to stop celebrating, and I get that. But before I read this verse, let me ask you something. Outside of Thursday, when you gathered around with your family to eat Thanksgiving dinner together, when before that was the last time that you thank, were thankful for something? When was the last time that you celebrated something? When was the last time? Oh, yeah, I know, a birthday party, a wedding anniversary, something like that. I get it. But when was the last time that you celebrated something that actually didn't have a date behind it? Folks, we need to celebrate often. Exodus chapter 12, verse 14 says this. This is a day you are to commemorate for the generations to come. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, a lasting, get it, a lasting ordinance or a permanent ordinance. You know why that means? Because he knows that you and I will forget it. You and I will forget it. In fact, I want to talk about this in closing. If you ever think about the word holiday, and you wonder, where does that word come from? Let me tell you where it comes from. It comes from the Old Testament, from the word holy day. That's where holidays come from. Holy days. We need to celebrate what God is doing. And you know what I decided long before we start making New Year's resolutions? What I decided this last year after going through a lot of struggles that I was facing, I decided this. I am going to stop looking at all of the junk and I'm going to be reminded of the things that I am the most thankful for. Because you know what? I can find it if I look for it. I can find something to grumble about too if I look for it. It's my choice. I get to choose what I want to do. 
And when I see somebody do something that is good, you know what? Why should we not stop and say, thank you for doing that? Thank you for being in that position. Thank you for being so courteous to help me with this. Sometimes we don't have enough courage or the time to think that it's important to say thank you. And you know what? I think that's one thing that we neglect. Do you know what happens when you and I begin to look for that which is right and worthy? And we acknowledge that. It changes the way that we look at everything. That's because now we're looking for it. But you know what happens when I grumble? Hmm. I start looking for more to grumble about. I was on a trip. I'm going to confess. Here goes the curtain again. I was on my way to Mississippi about two weeks ago, and I'm driving down mm, 45, something like that, near Mississippi, and things are going crazy. I, I, this is why I would rather fly any day of the week than drive. And this is one of those times it wasn't cars or trucks. It was everybody on the road. It was cars and trucks and semis and everything else, too, cutting people off, going in and out without, without giving a signal. I'm talking about crazy things where I had to stop on my brakes like three times or I would have been hit. And I'm sitting there looking at my wife and I'm saying, you know what? There are some crazy people on the road and they don't know how to stink and drive. That's what I said. Now, maybe your conversation is a lot different than that. I don't, I don't know. But I was aggravated. In fact, I was a little ticked off. You know what I started looking for? I looked for every other person I could find that wasn't driving properly on the road. And here I am. You know what I'm doing? I've got Sela on the CD. In case you don't know who Sela is, a Christian group. I've got Sela on the CD, and I'm grumbling and complaining about everybody else on the road and, pra and praising Jesus. <laughs> that sounds just about right, doesn't it? Because you know what? All it takes is a little bit. All it takes is that start. I start looking for this and looking for that. And you know what? If I look around here, I start looking here and looking there, and I can grumble about this and grumble about that. You can look at me. You can start grumbling about this that Pastor Dave does, and this is what Pastor Dave, you know, you, you can find a whole lot. In fact, you don't have to look hard. But what is it that God wants for you, and what does he want for me? There's something that's got to be different about you and me, that when people look at you, they say, ah, there's something different, something different about you. And we know that, it, that you're going through the same thing I'm going through, but why are you acting differently? It's not me. It's the joy of the Lord. It's a constant. It's something that doesn't change. It's always there. I'll tell you what. I say this because I've thought about this many times in my own life. You know what, Bev? I'm sitting here looking at you right now, and I'm thinking about my son. I'm thinking about losing my son, and how would I respond? And I know how hard it was for you, and I thought about how you responded every step of the way, Bev. And the joy of the Lord... He's in you. And you relied upon that. It wasn't your strength. It wasn't your own will. It was what God was doing. And when people saw that, Bev, I want you to know that makes a lot of people just stand up and pay attention. And you know what? Whatever tragedy, whatever pain that you suffer in your life, people are going to watch. How do you respond? Is that stolen your joy? Have you let your joy fall away because you aren't trusting in Him? instead of your, your, your experiences in life? Because if it's all about experiences, none of us are going to have anything to have joy over. But it's the Lord that we have joy in. It's what he's already done. Take heart that, folks, today. Take heart in that today. I don't know what your, your celebration is going to look like at Christmas time. Maybe there's grumbling in your family. I don't know what you're going through. But I can tell you this. My Christmas season is going to be good because he is so good. And tomorrow's gonna be good because he is so good. And no matter what comes my way, though I may have doubts, and I will, I can take great hope, great comfort, because he's already won. And I'm so grateful for that today. I'd like to ask that you stand with me this morning. I'd like for all the grumblers to please make their way to the front. Now, before we do that, let's just sing together this morning. Let the Lord speak to your heart this morning. If you want to pray, you want to step out, no one's going to grumble about you stepping out. They're going to be fine. If you want to deal with it right where you're at, that's fine too. But deal with it. Let God know that you're tired of living your own way. There's people that are going through great struggles in this sanctuary. And they're trusting in Him. 
Let's just sing to him this morning. Let's give him praise today. For I want you to know that the joy of the Lord is real. I want you to know that when you look around and those people around you, you may not even know it, but there are people who have gone through great struggles and you wouldn't know it by the way that they act. You wouldn't know it by the way that they, they hold themselves. I have a list here. You have a list of so many people in our church that are going through great battles right now. I think about Carl Kurtz and I think about a guy who's, ha- who's going through leukemia and now has found out that he has Crohn's disease. Every conversation I've ever had with him, you'll never hear him say a bitter thing. You know why? Because let me tell you, it's real in him. There is nothing fake about who he is. It's not because he's such a great guy. We love him, but it's, it's more than that. It's the joy of the Lord that's in his heart. You know, when I look around, and last week I was talking to Karen Kleps, and she was telling me about her father who passed away. And many of you didn't even maybe even know this, but they've traveled weeks upon weeks to go stay and be with them during this time of struggle. He passed away. The joy of the Lord is in her heart because she remembers the kind of man that he was, the way that he lived his life. I could go on and on and I could go on and on and tell you about situations in this congregation right now and the way that people have held their head up and said, I will not let that defeat me. It will not change who I am and whose I am. And can I tell you this morning, folks, that's what God calls all of us to be. To be people that do not waver, who do not change, who do not let circumstances dictate their relationship with Jesus. It is all about being all in trust in him fully no matter what tomorrow brings I'm so grateful I serve a God who's that strong that powerful has that much for my life has that much for your life and I pray that today that you find it I pray that you find the joy of the Lord you don't have to look it's right there it's waiting for you let's pray Father Lord how we love you Oh, how I long to run to your arms. I need you every day. I can't imagine living life without you. I can't imagine trying to do ministry without your strength, without your wisdom. I can't imagine trying to be a husband. I can't imagine trying to be a father without you. Oh, I would fail miserably. And though I still do from time to time, Lord, I'm so grateful. I can run back to your arms again. Thank you, Lord, for the joy that is always present. And I pray that we wake up every morning being reminded of the joy that we can have in you. Because days will come and days will go and times will be tough. But you will always be enough. So, Lord, for that we praise you today. Lord, it's in your precious and wonderful name that we pray. And all God's people said, amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful day in the Lord.